In my last video using NVIDIA's own data presented at GTC, I showed how the rasterized performance increase will not be that great for the RTX 4080, and I wondered, why did NVIDIA raise prices so drastically this generation? Well, Jensen made some proclamations to the media a day later. But do those proclamations explain the price increase? Let's get into it. In a gathering of the press, NVIDIA's Jensen Huang was asked about the price increase on the RTX 4000 GPUs. He was asked by none other than Gordon Ung from PC World. I love Gordon. Gordon is a seasoned veteran in covering the PC industry, and he had the experience, the tact, and the guts to ask the question everyone was thinking. Thank you, Gordon. Jensen answered the question by making several claims to explain the increase in prices. First, he said, Moore's Law is dead. Jensen said, and I quote, The ability for Moore's Law to deliver twice the performance at the same cost... Wait, stop right there. That statement gave me pause. Twice the performance? When did NVIDIA ever deliver a GPU that provided twice the performance in a generation? I went back in history. No, not Fermi 2, farther. No, farther. Yes, that's right. I went through 15 years of NVIDIA's high-end GPUs, all the way back to the GeForce 8800 GTX, which is based on the Tesla architecture, and it was the first GPU to use the unified shader model. And I charted the performance gain from one generation to the next for the high-end gaming GPU, and this is the resulting chart. In moving from the 8800 GTX to the GTX 280, it was a huge 88% increase in performance, but still not two times to satisfy Moore's Law. Fermi in the GTX 480 provided a 57% increase, and Fermi 2 later that year provided another 24% increase. Kepler in the GTX 780 Ti provided a whopping 90% increase over the GTX 580, however, that was over a three year period of time. Since then, we have not come close to anything resembling twice the performance. Since the implementation of the unified shader model, NVIDIA has never made a GPU that provided twice the performance from generation to generation. By his definition of Moore's Law, it has never been alive at NVIDIA in the first place. Let's look up the definition of Moore's Law. For those who don't know, it's not really a law, but rather it's an observation, a doubling of transistors every two years. Using this definition, I plotted the number of transistors in the high-end GPUs that used a large die from Tesla all the way up to Turing. That is the green line. I then plotted a line that represents Moore's Law that is a doubling of transistors from the previous generation. That is the black line. So when the green line goes above the black line, NVIDIA doubled the transistors, and you can say, Moore's Law is alive. But when the green line is below the black line, NVIDIA did not double the number of transistors from one gen to the next, and so Moore's Law is dead. What you see is that Moore's Law is alive up to Maxwell, and then it died back in 2014, eight years ago. But if we now expand the chart to include Ampere and now Ada, we can see that it was still dead with Ampere, but with the almost tripling of transistors in Ada, Moore's Law is alive again. So by the strict definition of Moore's Law, Jensen is wrong. Now the implication of Moore's Law is that the cost will get cheaper over time as well. Let's look at the prices of the high-end GPUs since Tesla was introduced in 2006. You can see that the Tesla high-end GPUs were in the $600 to $650 range. Fermi was a little bit lower and kept it at $500. Kepler and Maxwell moved it up to $650 and Pascal added yet another $50. It's only Turing and Ampere that crossed the $1,000 mark. So the price started to get out of control in 2018 with Turing. Let's move beyond the Moore's Law thing and get back to what else Jensen proclaimed. In his response to the high prices, Jensen said, and I quote, A 12-inch wafer is a lot more expensive today than it was yesterday. Not a little bit more expensive, it is a ton more expensive. Unquote. The cost of the wafer will directly impact the cost of the die, since the die is just cut up from the wafer. So that makes sense. To understand the cost of the die and how much NVIDIA must charge for each die to pay for a wafer, we need to understand die sizes. To see how the die sizes have changed, I went back through the generations to Kepler and I found a common theme. To cover the range of gaming GPUs from the 60 series and up, they use a strategy of using three die sizes. Think of it as small, medium, and large dies. 
Now the names they give these die are meaningless. So don't get hung up on if it is called a 102, a 104, a 106, or now a 103. Just think of them as small, medium, and large. It's only the cost of the die that changes as you change the size of the die and the number of die on each wafer. You can see that the small dies are typically between 200 and 300 millimeters squared. Turing is the aberration and we'll talk about that later. The medium die are typically between 300 and 400 millimeters squared. Again, Turing is the aberration. And the large die are typically around 500 millimeters squared and higher. Turing had the larger die size for all the RTX 2000 GPUs since they added ray tracing cores and tensor cores. The ray tracing cores enabled hardware based ray tracing and the tensor cores are for DLSS. With the much larger die sizes, you can understand why RTX GPUs did cost more than the previous GTX 10 series. Getting back to the chart, I then put labels next to the die to designate which GPU models were made from which die size for each generation. For example, in Kepler, the large die was used in the GTX 780 and 780 Ti. The middle die was used for the GTX 770 and GTX 680 all the way down to the GTX 660 Ti. And the small die was used for the GTX 750 and the GTX 660. By the way, if you like analysis like this, hit that like button, share this video, and consider subscribing. When looking at the chart, two characteristics become obvious. First, the small die has been used for the 60 series of GPUs. Second, the large die has been used in the high-end GPUs like the 80 Ti models. I know, Ampere was unusual, as it also was on the large die. That was NVIDIA's reaction to the threat imposed by AMD's Big Navi. The medium-sized die has been used from everything from an 80 series GPU all the way down to a 60 Ti. Now if I add the pricing of the Ampere cards, starting with the large die, those GPUs were priced from $699 in the 3080 up to $1999 in the 3090 Ti. For the medium-sized die, the pricing went from $399 in the 3060 Ti to $599 in the 3070 Ti. And in the small die, the 3060 pricing is at $329. Moving on to ADA, and if I add the pricing of the large die that is in the 4090, it has an MSRP of $1599. Now, this is the part that I recommend you sit down if you're not already sitting. Putting the price on the new ADA medium size die in the 4080 16GB, it is $1199. Yes, double the 3070Ti, which was also on the medium size die. And I have to remind you that the ADA medium sized die is slightly smaller than the Ampere medium sized die. So the die size reduced slightly from Ampere and yet Nvidia added $600 to the GPU. Wait, it gets worse. Putting the price on the new small die in the 4080 Imposter, you can see the price of the small die GPU now went from $329 to $900. And the ADA small die size is just 19 millimeters squared larger at 295 versus Ampere's small die size at 276. Let that sink in a bit. For me, this was jaw dropping. When looking at this chart, this is more shocking to me than when I compared the disappointing price to performance of the new 4080s versus the old 3080. I'll put a link if you haven't yet seen that video. To realize that what NVIDIA once charged for the small dies and put into sub $400 GPUs, they now put the new ADA small die into a product that is starting at $900. How does the cost of the new ADA small die add $500 to the GPU? And how does the medium sized die move from a $600 GPU up to a $1,200 GPU? How does the new ADA medium sized die add $600? This is totally unprecedented. A medium sized die has never been put into a GPU that cost more than $1,000. And a small size die GPU has never cost almost $1,000. Something does not add up here. Let's go back to what Jensen said. A 12 inch wafer is a lot more expensive today than it was yesterday. It's not a little bit more expensive. It is a ton more expensive. How can the cost of the new die increase that much? Think about this. AMD just launched Ryzen 7000 CPUs using TSMC's 5 nanometer process and they didn't raise prices. And Apple has been making all of its M1 chips on the 5 nanometer process since 2020 and they didn't raise prices of their products. 
Understanding the four nanometer process is just an enhanced five nanometer process doesn't justify a GPU price increase of five to six hundred dollars. No, something doesn't add up here. Let me know in the comments below if you are convinced of Jensen's reasoning to get you to pay a ton more for his precious new GPUs. I don't think Jensen can blame it all on the wafer cost. How do I know? We'll cover that next time. Thank you all so very much for watching. Stay safe and I will see you in the next one.